Welcome, everyone. This is our third event in um, DFF's 2021 speaker series, Taking the Digital Welfare State to Court. My name is Jonathan McCulley, and I am DFF's legal advisor. With me behind the scenes, so to speak, are my colleagues Judith Rahofer, DFF's legal officer, and our events officer, Jihan Jadran. Together, we will try our best to ensure that this webinar goes smoothly and we do not succumb to any technical difficulties for the hour that we are together here. Um, to give you all a bit of a background to the series, over the past two years, the protection and promotion of human rights in the context of the digital welfare state has been a major focus of our work here at DFF. We have seen over the last few years an increasing ado adoption of techno solutionism by governments in the provision of social security and other vital public services. The digitization of social welfare has often been motivated by government's desire for efficiency, cost cutting and fraud detection, and at the expense of civil, political, economic and social rights. We have already discussed these issues at a number of our workshops, like for instance, our litigating algorithms workshop in 2019. We've also held a number of one-on-one -on -one and group consultations with a range of organizations working on the topic and based on these consultations, produced a strategic document to inspire conversations on how strategic litigation could be used as part of a broader strategy to address the harms of the digital welfare state. You can find that document and much more information about our other activities in this area on the DFF website. We also continue to engage with a range of other organizations on this topic, including racial, social, and economic justice organizations as part of our ongoing Digital Rights for All project. Our objective here is to provide a space to the people most affected by the harmful use of technologies and who are often missing from digital rights policy circles, develop their own agenda in how to challenge these technologies through advocacy and litigation. This is a process that our colleague Laurence Mayer, um, who leads on that project, has just summarized in a great blog post on our website, nothing about us without us. This year's speaker series seeks to complement that work by exploring a range of cases from different jurisdictions and relating to a range of different digital welfare issues to show how strategic litigation can be used by and in collaboration with these communities to protect their digital and human rights. Uh, so far, we have heard about the biometric ID system, ADHAR, um, that has threatened the fundamental rights to food and to life in India, and the automated profiling of unemployed individuals by secret unaccountable algorithm that violated job, job seekers' rights in Poland. The topic of today's event is automating care, challenging assessment by computer in Arkansas. And today, we'll be taking a look at a litigation campaign that sought to challenge an algorithm that replaced nurses in carrying out assessments of individuals' care needs in Arkansas. This policy shift resulted in the cutting of vital Medicaid home care benefits to individuals who have disabilities or who are elderly. Um, Kevin DeLiban, uh, Director of Advocacy at Legal Aid of Arkansas, is joining us today, and he will talk about the case he helped bring before the Supreme Court of Arkansas and the litigation he continues to work on to protect human rights against the ever-increasing digitization of social care. And moderating the conversation today is Shannon Valour. Just a brief introduction for our two speakers today. As I mentioned, Kevin DeLiban is Director of Advocacy at the Legal Aid of Arkansas, and he leads multi-dimensional efforts to improve the lives of low-income Arkansans in the matter of health, workers' rights, safety net benefits, housing, consumer rights, and domestic violence. He regularly presents about imposing accountability in artificial intelligence and algorithms, and his work has appeared on or in The Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, The Economist, The Verge, and other publications and podcasts. When not practicing law, Kevin is passionately creating music as a rapper. And Shannon Valour is the Bailey Gifford Chair in the Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence at the Edinburgh Futures Institute at the University of Edinburgh, where she is also appointed in philosophy. Shannon's research explores how new te technologies, especially AI, robotics, and data science, reshape human moral character, habits, and practices. Her work includes advising policymakers and industry on the ethical design and use of AI, and she currently chairs Scotland's Data Delivery Group. Uh, she has published widely and is the author of the book, Technology and the Virtues, a philosophical guide to a future worth wanting. 
thank you both for, for joining us today. Before I hand the virtual mic over to you, um, I just want to uh, set out what, what to expect from this session today. So um, Shannon and Kevin will spend about 30 minutes talking about the background to the litigation work Kevin has been doing. Um, and uh, while they're talking, we encourage all of you out there in the dark, in the virtual Zoom room, to use the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of your, your Zoom tab uh, to ask any questions you might have uh, for Kevin. Uh, so it's, it's, you'll find it at the bottom of your screen to your right. We'll have about 20 minutes towards the end uh, of the webinar today to allow Kevin to answer as many questions as you might have as possible. And please do submit your your questions into the Q&A function anytime it comes into your mind. There's no need to wait until the Q&A section. We know how frustrating it can be to kind of remember a question after you've been sitting on it for 15 minutes. So let's, let's avoid that. Type away, give us your questions, um, and, and we'll get them to Kevin to answer. No pressure, Kevin. Um, and on that note, and without further ado, Shannon, Kevin, the floor is yours. So Thanks. Much, Jonathan. It's delighting. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, hi, Kevin. I'm, I'm so glad that you're here with us uh, for this event today. Um, on a personal note, your case is one that I've followed for the last several years, uh, along with a number of similar cases in the United States, um, with which you'll be very familiar. Uh, our audience might know of them or, or, or not, the KW versus Armstrong case in Idaho, uh, the Midas case in Michigan. Um, I bring up these cases whenever I speak to someone in government who's considering automating some part of public services. And invariably, they seem completely unaware of this legacy of automation gone wrong in the public sector. I, I moved to the UK last year. I can see the same push here and in Europe to replace human judgment in the public sector with opaque forms of machine automation. And it's really important that cases like yours are well understood so that we can avoid recent history repeating itself. So to that end, can you tell us a little bit about the origins of this litigation, how it came about, who was involved and how you became connected with the case? Of course. Um, so the starting point, I guess, is legal aid organizations. We exist to provide free legal services to low income individuals in all kinds of civil legal matters. Um, and so our work is being on the front lines with people experiencing poverty um, and all the issues that they might face, whether it's domestic violence or consumer protection issues or uh, bad landlords or um, public benefits. And that's where my specialty has been in, in public benefits. Um, for those of you who don't know, of course, there's no national health care program that covers everybody in the United States. Our program for low income folks is called Medicaid. Each state has its own version of Medicaid with some commonalities and some things left up to the states to decide. One option that states have is to provide home and community-based services to people um, who are elderly or have disabilities of various sorts. The idea being that by caring for somebody in the home, uh, we can avoid institutionalization, um, avoid having to put folks in nursing homes and things like this. And of course, that's much better for somebody's dignity and just autonomy and self-worth and all of that good stuff. Um, and it's also generally cheaper for the state than warehousing people in um, what have proven to be, especially during the pandemic, very cruel um, and dangerous places. And so Arkansas had one of these home and community-based services programs. Um, and for it had been in effect for 17, 20 years, something like that. And throughout that whole time, what would happen is a nurse would come to your home, would talk to you about your uh, conditions, your care needs, what you needed help with, how much help you needed and arrive at a number of hours that you would be able to receive. And this would be hours of care from an outside paid caregiver to come and help you live independently. Um, the maximum amount of care was roughly eight hours per day. Now, this wasn't enough, okay? If you have cerebral palsy or multiple sclerosis or you have quadriplegia, um, eight hours a day is, doesn't really meet your care needs. But if it's divvied up just right and you know there aren't a lot of disruptions in scheduling and people don't call out sick, it's enough for many people to be able to remain at home. And so that was the status quo. What ended up happening in 2016 is we started getting a call. At first, it calls. It was first to trickle, you know, one this week, one next week. Within a few weeks, it was like a flood. We were getting all sorts of calls. And what people said 
They've been on the program for years. The same nurse came and evaluated me, but my care is being cut and I don't know why. And the only thing that they could tell us was that the nurse said the computer did it. And that was the key that led us to some deeper looking and deeper thinking and recognizing ultimately that it was an algorithm in place that was causing these massive uh, cuts in care to people whose conditions hadn't got any better. And that kind of, that was early 2016. And that sort of has led us on the journey that uh, we're at and talking about here today. Oh, you're muted, Shannon. Sorry. Why was it so uh, important to engage the courts on this issue? Uh, and, and what has the litigation achieved so far in the case? So uh, hmm. we had to engage the courts because the agency that we were working with, the government agency whose decision this was, of course, was filled with recalcitrant people who didn't, uh, you know, who were invested in this program and didn't really understand it and just thought, OK, um, we're going to go here. So we had to fight because some people were stubborn and hard headed. And that gets to the issue of incentives, which, you know, we'll talk about later. Um, so we went to court within, I think, four months, three, four months of actually hearing about this. It took us a little time to puzzle together what was going on enough to put a case together. Um, and then we went to court right away. Um, we had a federal case at first that we were victorious on. Um, then we had a state based case that we were victorious on. Of course, throughout this, the state never wanted to improve the program. Um, and ultimately, we were able to invalidate the algorithm and get rid of it. When the state attempted to revive it, uh, by that point, through public education efforts and organizing efforts, the affected community had been uh, very active and organized and was able to convince the legislature that this is not the way to go. And the legislature kind of reinforced um, what the courts had said and forced the state to abandon the system and transition to a new system. That's that's great. So thinking about um, not just this case and not just Arkansas, uh, but the broader landscape, uh, what work do you think still needs to be done um, by courts, uh, by litigators, by government, um, by advocates uh, for the public, um, drawing on your own experience and, and expertise and knowledge of this case? Sure. At the most basic level, of course, uh, advocates need to be attuned to what's happening, how it's happening, excuse me, how it's happening, and how to contest it using existing tools, right? So um, I think especially advocates who are working with people experiencing poverty or near poverty um, need to be really attuned to this so you can perceive what's going on where and then start fighting. Um, on a more broad scale, the regulatory regimes and legal regimes around these things have to change because at least in the US, we're limited mostly to procedural based claims. So due process, the right to, you know, have adequate notice of the government's decision and explanation for it and a chance to contest it um, is a procedural claim. And so, you know, you can bring that and you can be very successful at it, but ultimately it's something that's can be cured. Um, and then you have other claims like Administrative Procedures Act claims, rule, rule adoption claims, um, where the government has to give the public a certain amount of uh, opportunity to provide input. And then depending on where you are, they might have to consider that input um, and things like this. And again, most of the claims are procedural in nature. So there are ways using existing, uh, existing causes of action to try to get at the underlying validity of the algorithms. Um, but it's hard. It's hard. We don't have a clear cut cause of action for, for that. So just in terms of like harm mitigation, that's what you have to do. I think there's also a lot of things that we, we need to talk about around changing incentives for vendors, for government actors and everything else um, to make sure that they can't implement these wildly harmful systems that wreak havoc on people's lives at the touch of a button. And um, that's all harm you can't undo and you can't get back. Yeah, and I think that speaks also to um, the limitations of uh, the court systems and, and court actions. So maybe you could say a little bit more about what uh, broader kinds of reforms uh, you think might bring about um, uh, a more substantive and enduring uh, solution to, to these harms. Certainly. Um, so there are things that are a little bit in our grasp and things that I think have to be pushed for uh, for a long time. So in our grasp, is 
challenging the immunity that state officials have when they uh, make decisions. And I don't know if there's a corresponding doctrine um, in various European jurisdictions, but in the United States, there's something called qualified immunity. This has been in the news, at least domestically, a lot because police officers who've been murdering largely people of color, largely black men, um, have been able to be immune from any sort of personal liability um, for their unconstitutional actions. That same kind of immunity applies to government officials in other settings who are deciding to adopt algorithmic decision making or implementing them and deploying them. Um, and, you know, these actors who are essentially either political appointees or agency, um, career agency officials are totally insulated from political liability or from any kind of liability. Um, and that's because they're implementing things that are their bosses have told them to implement. So they have political cover for it. Um, and as long as they are immune from any sort of liability, they don't necessarily have incentives to get it right. You know, even if we win a court case and the agency has to change something, maybe it makes their life hard, right? Maybe it gives them more work, but it ultimately doesn't affect them and they might fail up to other jobs. So I think something that's in our grasp is certainly challenging um, the qualified immunity of officials like this. Um, and I think there's some movement around that. And we have a case about that right now. In the longer term, bigger picture, I mean, it's everything. It's, you know, potentially forbidding the use of algorithmic decision making in kind of public uh, social welfare settings. Um, it's creating clear causes of action about the validity. It's having increased public participation requirements with challenge points along the way. Um, it's empowering courts to be able to address, um, you know, whether um, the state has properly projected um, or run tests or made it so that the algorithm, if implemented, is going to do what it says it's supposed to do and not cause widespread harm. So there's other things that we could potentially um, regulate around um, that would, um, you know, kind of address the underlying problems and keep us from having to fight so many individualized battles. So one question I have for you, uh, you know, I, I see a lot in the media the word algorithm being used in a context that can really mislead people into thinking that algorithms are some brand new invention or that algorithms are uh, distinctly a feature of you know, the digital computing uh, domain or that they're distinctly associated with artificial intelligence. When in fact, um, algorithmic decision-making has been part of the social services bureaucracy uh, for as long as those bureaucracies have existed and been rule governed in any way, right? Thinking about an algorithm in the broad sense of a kind of rule governed recipe for making some kind of decision. So putting that to, to you then, when you spoke a moment ago about, you know, potentially banning the use of algorithms in these kinds of systems, what does that mean in practice? Um, do, does that mean, you know, radically uh, stripping away any kind of rule governed approach to social services? Um, or is it a particular kind of algorithm that we ought to be worried about? Um, the, the kinds that are uh, perhaps more opaque and harder to contest than others. What's your take on that? Yeah, we see in the social welfare context kind of two general, maybe three general varieties of algorithms. Um, you see things that are operationalizing uh, kind of administrative tasks, right? How often does somebody have to recertify that they're eligible for certain kinds of benefits and automating the process of sending out that form or collecting that information or doing data matching to, to, to sort that. Um, and those kind of algorithms, uh, if we're going to call them that, certainly have been weaponized um, by people who want to pair roles down. Um, though the underlying idea of increasing function and efficiency without attaching kind of judgment-based discretionary decisions isn't as problematic. You get then two other kinds of algorithms that are problematic. One are kind of the care rationing, deciding how much, uh, in our case, care or other sorts of benefits somebody's going to get, which is um, presumably an attempt at measurement, right? And like, how much of something do you need? Um, and then another one is also a form of human measurement, which is fraud detection. Um, and I think in those latter two cases, those are ones that are particularly problematic. And I think, you know, you could forbid the use of 
automating of the rule-based system governing them um, without, uh, without, I don't think, too much problem and too much other loss. Because the fact is, is those kinds of algorithms have been strictly used to cut benefits or to make benefits harder to access or to undermine kind of whatever social welfare system they are. Um, and it's not as if the algorithmic decisions being programmed by humans have any greater um, judgment than humans without those automated systems. And introducing the automation to the system creates all sorts of other problems in terms of monitoring it, right? Your ability to challenge it, your ability to maintain it. Um, and uh, of course, the scale is also problematic. And we saw in the Michigan case about the Midas fraud system, you know, you have whatever it is, 90, 100,000 people who then are suddenly driven to the, you know, edges of financial, like survival uh, at the touch of a button because, this, you know, the agency builds a system and deploys it. So I think in those latter two cases, fraud, um, benefits rationing, those, I don't see any uh, compelling argument, at least in practice, that there's any basis for for having automated decision making, algorithm based decision making, um, there. I think what you're um, what you're talking about uh, reminds me of a of a of a piece that is not as well known as it should be, but but still pretty influential um, uh, in in a lot of uh, fields where people are thinking about these issues. Uh, of automation and its effects on society. I'm thinking of a, a, a paper that was written in 1983 uh, by a scholar named uh, Lisanne Bainbridge. Um, the paper uh, is called Ironies of Automation. And one of the uh, things that uh, she talks about in the paper is that as we automate more human labor, um, although the amount of net human labor that's required in a system to perform a given task will decrease, the amount of human intelligence that the system has to have in order to uh, operate properly is actually increasing. So the idea being that the, the, the sort of labor hours might decrease with automation, but if you're going to avoid these kinds of catastrophic errors and harms, you actually need more net human intelligence in the system than you did before when you were less automated. Um, so what do you think about that in relation uh, to, to these challenges? Is part of the problem that we're simply automating in such a way that we don't see that to get the gains in automation of efficiency and scale, we would have to also invest uh, even more in human intelligence and, and oversight and, uh, and judgment when in fact, the way the bureaucrats look at it, the more you automate, the less you need human intelligence in the, in the works? Right. I mean, that's such an interesting dynamic. I think the, the first point I would say is that at least in the algorithmic decision-making context that we're talking about, care rationing, fraud, basically enforcing austerity-driven policies, um, there is no efficiency. The idea of efficiency is just the guise under which vendors sell these and governments sell these. Um, what they actually are is a tool to achieve policy ends of austerity and cuts that um, might not otherwise be possible because either they're politically unpopular or um, whatever else might keep them. So I think the starting point is we have to challenge that assumption that there is anything to be gained. But that said, even assuming that frame, um, yes. And I think because of the you know 40 plus year project, at least in the US and I think in the UK and I'm sure elsewhere in places I'm less familiar with, um, there's been a project to hollow out government, right? Government is the enemy. And so we're going to limit the way it can uh, regulate actors. We're going to cut agency budgets. We're going to limit social services and all of that. And that's what algorithms are doing. And so to the extent that you know, there is even any sort of fair, uh, fairness or efficiency rationale, there, the governments are no longer in a place to meaningfully control them because of the lack of... Uh, I don't want to say intelligence, but the lack of intelligence in the way, Shannon, that you put it out um, in that, for example, in Arkansas, there was not a single person on the state roster that could understand or explain the algorithm. I went in, I have no computer science background and had to figure out what 20, 21 pages of code meant and how these things corresponded to items on the assessment. And I explained to the state what was wrong with their algorithm, both in terms that it didn't work as it was intended to work, like there was a software error in it, and that even when it worked, 
as it was intended to work. It was wildly irrational and arbitrary. And so that dynamic you highlight is exactly that, is that there's no uh, capacity in state agencies or in federal agencies, probably for that matter, to monitor them. And that's everything from the from the frontline decision of the nurse who's assessing somebody who has no idea of how their assessment is going to factor into the algorithm, to the agency staff who potentially runs the program, to the administrative law judges or people to whom you're supposed to be able to contest the decision if you've been adversely affected. Um, they don't question it either because of automation bias. So what you say is exactly right um, and is yet another reason, even if you agree that maybe algorithms have something to offer in these contexts, which I don't. But if you think that there's the practicalities and another argument against it, that they can't be managed appropriately. Yeah, well, that was one of the most striking things I, I remember about the case in Idaho as well, that when the judge ordered uh, an analysis of what had gone wrong, uh, it came out that uh, I think the, 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 the line that really stuck with me was everyone thought that somebody else knew how it worked um, and that somebody else had, had validated uh, the the algorithm. And of course, no one knew how it worked. No one had validated it. It was running on garbage data. Um, but but no one, I mean, at least if we interpret, you know, these uh, uh, statements charitably, um, it, it would it would seem that um, that you really have a failure of, of human intelligence and a failure to invest in that. Not that people aren't intelligent, but that they haven't been um, empowered to use that intelligence in order uh, to to properly oversee what's happening. Um, but as you point out, we mentioned automation bias, right? And that's the tendency to overtrust uh, in an automated, uh, particularly a computer-driven judgment. Um, and, and that kind of gets wrapped into the way these things are implemented because if I have justified the replacement of a human with a machine, presumably I can only justify that on the basis that the machine is so, is, is going to be on balance a more reliable judge. And if I believe that, then if even putting a sort of human in the loop, as they say, right, a human oh, yeah. oversight into the system, yeah. why would that person feel empowered to overrule a machine that has been described as superior to their own judgment and having access to information that they can't process? So it becomes a, a sort of vicious cycle of sort of rubber stamping these, these decisions. Yeah, and I mean, uh, you know, it's funny, and I come to this a bit cynically, I think, because I see the effect on poor people and I see the total lack of care or even professional responsibility taken by state agencies in implementing this. So, you know, I, I come at it very cynically. Uh, I mean, the first part is, is that there is no justification and the agency officials a lot of times don't have any sense of justification other than, oh, okay, cutting and some, you know, limited understanding of fairness or all this nonsense. Um, and that's farcical, right? And then it is farcical also uh, that, uh, that they can be managed in any way. In Arkansas, there were no projections about the impact of this, right? Like I, just in your daily life, like if you make a significant decision, you think, oh, okay, what are going to be the long-term impacts? If you're running a, a, a program for tens of thousands of people who are incredibly vulnerable and you don't think to run a projection, you know, that, 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 that's not naive, uh, you know, that's not naivety. That's just, that's negligence. you know, that's bureaucratic cruelty. That's disdain yeah. for the people you're serving. There was no testing to make sure the algorithm works as a design. There was nobody on staff who could explain it. it the, the contracting was so poor that they had to pay vendors, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to run basic oversight reports. I mean, that whole stuff is farcical. And so this human in the loop nonsense is part of the evolving tactics to try to make, again, what are essentially cruel, uh, you know, hollowing out of safety net sort of policies um, somehow palatable. The human in the loop notion is, is, is pretty much as farcical for a, an accountability regime as pure transparency. is. It's ridiculous. None of this stuff gets at the underlying issues of we're cutting people's benefits and there's no way to challenge it. There's nothing there. Um, and, you know, there's another thing that's hinted at in, 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 in what you just brought up, Shannon, that reminds me is it's the algorithm becomes the thing, right? It's like, and, and I have a hard time expressing it, but so somebody's care needs are now not something that can be timed, observed, or assessed. Somebody's care needs are what the algorithm says they are. So the algorithm becomes the thing. 
right? And it's almost a, a defeating rationality, at least human rationality, as it comes to human in the loop stuff. Yes, a human programmed this somewhere and designed it and maybe had some data validating the choices they made in, in terms of, of programming the algorithm. But the idea that something that we can all measure relatively easily um, is now not what it is, seems to me a concession um, to a sort of uh, perverse rationality that, 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 that defeats the purpose of you know, these sort of social welfare systems and keeping people, you know, at a minimum level of, yeah. of, of material existence, you know? So I think that, you know, two things come to mind from what you just said. One is um, when you describe uh, the lack of, of care and lack of diligence in the implementation of, of the Arkansas system, uh, and to your point earlier uh, about the uh, attempt to undermine uh, government as a uh, effective mechanism for meeting people's needs. Uh, if you want to be cynical, right, you couldn't design a better way to convince people that government was worthless than to build a system like this and use it, try to use it to meet their needs, right? It's it's exactly the way you convince people uh, that government services are uh, are a waste or not to be trusted or or are, are harmful. Um, so I, I think that deep critique needs to be taken on board. I, I want to also pick up what you just said about, and, and this is so important actually, about the measurement becoming the thing, not the not what is to be measured, not not the thing that we're actually supposed to be caring about, but the measurement itself becomes the object of attention and concern, um, and and what it purports to be about recedes into the background. So how can we keep all of these efforts? centered upon the vital interests and needs of people, uh, of citizens, of clients, of uh, residents of communities that uh, deserve to be to be cared for. Um, because I think they can recede into the background, both in this sort of algorithmic sort of decentering of their needs, but even the legal system, right? They can recede into the background and become lost in a kind of legal game that leaves them without real agency. So how do we bring... Um, the, the needs and dignity and rights um, and lives uh, of these people that are part of our society that we're supposed to, to uh, care about? Uh, um, and how, how do we recenter them? Again, I guess thinking broadly, of course, there's reformulating, you know, systems of participation and governance <laughs> on a mass scale, right? And, you know, that's everything from campaign financing to voting laws and um, making it easy to vote and other sorts of, you know, participatory politics. It's getting rid of barriers to participation that are oftentimes, you know, consciously erected, whether it's, you know, based on race, class, ability, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, there's the kind of fundamentally reshifting stuff that maybe we can be working towards in the long term. Um, in the shorter term, uh, it, it depends. I think the future, at least in places that have politically hostile legislation, and maybe even where there's politically favorable legislatures is um, is organizing and kind of ground up ground up work. You know, the people who are affected by this um, certainly understand why it's unfair and why it's um, inappropriate and are hurt by it. Um, being able to work with folks to amplify those voices, to organize those people, to participate is something that... Um, you know, I think those of us who are professional advocates uh, certainly need to um, figure out how we can do. And there's a lot there, right? I mean, there's public education, for example, like we went out and talked to affected communities about and others who are interested about how the algorithm works and why it's so irrational. And how come one point on one question out of 286 means a difference of, you know, two care hours per day, like the, the absurdities of the algorithm you can talk about. We helped put together videos of clients' lives that then people could share. I, I mean, of course, all this was done consensually and, you know, in a, in a way that was, that was um, you know, respectful. Um, but that then people could share and say, hey, this is what's happening to me. And it, we were able to kind of help affected folks organize themselves. Um, and I think that's really important. Uh, on the other end, you, you got to have somebody who's willing to listen to an organized community. And... In our case, we had the perfect alignment. We have a, a very conservative legislature in Arkansas um, who generally is not favorable to people experiencing poverty. But because these were people who, who were either elderly or had apparent physical disabilities, they were part of what are the so-called worthy poor. And so 
these folks were able to advocate for themselves, had a receptive audience because they were they met the sympathies of the of the legislature. There was also industry alignment in that the agencies that provided care to these folks didn't like the algorithm any more than the other people because their their bottom line was getting cut. And so you had this unique alignment of forces that I think allowed uh, a political victory. You know that those conditions don't exist everywhere, and um, and then I think it's it ends up being, you know, the courts for what you can get, the courts for what you can slow down, and then political power for all the rest of it, organizing and you know, and hopefully getting more receptive decision makers um, in office. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I, I think we've uh, set the stage for uh, for a continuation of the conversation with the audience. And I know that the audience has been putting questions uh, in the chat and there's still time to do that. So I wanna encourage the audience uh, to uh, uh, continue to uh, put your questions uh, into the chat and uh, we'll take the next 20 minutes or so uh, to try to answer them. So uh, I've got a question here uh, from Laura Hand about accountability outside the courts in the legal system. Um, so she says, it seems like the nature of algorithmic systems don't allow for traditional notions of accountability with a particular person being responsible for the problem um, and the ability to challenge a decision in the first place or even being able to examine or identify the specific source of harm. Holding states or institutions accountable through the legal system is obviously important, but are there other options or ways of thinking about accountability? Do we need a new vision of accountability in the public sector? Um, I want to say yes. Um, and I think it gets, uh, you know, maybe some to shaming um, and to calling out vendors have been largely invisible in this debate. And I think they like it. You know, they get the fancy contracts, they get a lot of money and all the blame falls on the government. And unless it's so bad that the government turns and sues the vendor, um, uh, the vendors just sitting pretty. Um, and of course, they're also operating you know, they're selling a product that there's a market for. So I think turning more attention to vendors certainly is, um, you know, one way. And some of that might be accountability in the traditional legalistic sense. And some of that may be through alternative forms of, you know, basically shaming, calling out whatever it is saying, hey, you're, you're doing what is fundamentally destructive work. Um, and do you really want to be part of that? Um, but I would be very excited to hear about accountability mechanisms um, outside of those because of the dynamics that the, you know, that the audience members question highlights and that who do you pin this on and then how do you hold them responsible? And, you know, even in electoral politics, thinking about something like this, like, okay, this is, this is something that's implemented by one state agency. Yes, it's an executive branch agency. But how much, how bad would it have to be for the governor to face significant questions um, in terms of electoral politics and being, you know, a threat of not being elected because of something like this, when it involves poor people, when it involves something relatively arcane? So, I mean, I agree that accountability mechanisms are, are limited. And I think my, my limited imagination only can think of shaming and values-based yeah. accountability for now. Shannon, you might have some ideas on that, though. Yeah. I, I might, I might, uh, but they're not perhaps too too different from from yours. But um, okay. I mean, I think there needs to be a broader. I think a, a lot of what you're saying suggests that we we need to be able to think beyond the failure of a, of a single system or even a set of systems, and think about the the broader um, turn away from common care in our society that um, that really underlies much of this, and think about how that cultural shift back to um, uh, a society where common care is the central value. How do we get back to that? Um, but I want to come back to the previous point uh, because uh, actually what you started talking about uh, happened to align perfectly with the next question that was coming in uh, from, um, from Hinako. And she asks uh, about the, um, the limitations um, uh, the, to litigation when we're talking about the private companies, the vendors uh, that are that are working with these governments, uh, because they are often insured uh, in their contracts against the financial hits from litigation, right? So uh, if you're if you're selling a turnkey system to the government um, and your contract uh, uh, holds you harmless uh, in the case that the government uses it in a way that uh, causes harm, 
Um, how do we how do we change those incentives? Um, you talk about naming and shaming. Um, is there any ongoing project uh, that you're aware of to reveal who is selling software to governments for welfare reform? Um, or is there any other possible way to hold these count, uh, companies responsible and accountable for the harm that they're causing? So in terms of ongoing efforts, I think there have been media stories tracking the biggest players like the Deloitte's and McKinsey's and IBM's, you know, and there have been some well-known failures on those kind of massive systems. A lot of times those have been more the modernization efforts, the automation of the administration, less the discretionary functions, um, and showing what a disaster those companies have, have caused. In Rhode Island, for example, there was, um, you know, I think it was Deloitte rebuilt the state's food stamp system, the SNAP system, our, one of our food security programs. And it was disastrous. Nobody was getting their benefits for several months in a row. And eventually it was so bad and cost the state so much money that the state itself took action against the vendor. Um, that's going to be the extraordinary circumstance. Um, so, I mean, right now, accountability mechanisms are media, states who sue for breach of contract. I think it'd be wonderful to have, um, you know, a legal theory that would allow third party enforcement of contracts. So if somebody was hurt by this vendor's algorithm, even if it was implemented through the state, that somehow the, the vendor could be liable. Um, and I think creative thinking needs to be done around all that. Um, and maybe there are some consumer rights attorneys um, who, who have some better ideas um, than I do right now. Um, and that might be a, an important place for kind of, uh, you know, more collaboration legally outside of the legal sphere, um, that I, then I, then I don't know anything beyond, um, naming and shaming and media and all that good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, what we see often is that the naming and shaming is something that, uh, happens in a, in a way that has no, uh, systematic organization uh, 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 to it. Uh, it's, you know, people going on Twitter and, and doing what they can and sometimes being effective, right? Um, uh, but it's a one, it's a whack-a-mole game, right? If, if you're playing it that way. Um, and, and so the, the question of, of, I think it's really interesting uh, what the questioner is proposing, the idea of a more systematic attempt uh, to, uh, to track uh, these vendors and, uh, and evaluate their um, uh, their contribution to the problem. So um, another question uh, that came in is about uh, what the questioner is describing as a sort of go with the flow mentality in a lot of these processes where there's a lack of interest in understanding the impact of these systems. Um, do you think that's changing? Do you think cases like yours uh, can at least make um, uh, representatives and, and um, uh, employees in the public sector and managers in the public sector more interested in asking the kinds of questions that they have not been asking about these systems? Sure. And if any state official ends up having to pay out of their own pocket for, um, for liability, even more so. Yeah. Um, so we can increase it that way. And I mean, you know, the, the other thing that's structured is like the advocates were all, uh, you know, so out moneyed and outgunned and overwhelmed. The way these relationships develop is you know, there's uh, conferences that state agency officials go to where vendors are set up, where vendors have presentations, where they're pitching the value of their idea. And some state agency official hears about it and then they come in. And by the time, you know, a lot of times state agency officials don't have good relationships with advocates or don't want to hear from affected communities. And then they start down, you know, the road and it's, it's, it's too late. So that's one dynamic is, you know, how all of this stuff, stuff even conceptually occurs. Another dynamic is that sometimes you have really good state agency officials who are career officials who care about administering a good program and care about the people they serve, and they aren't the ones necessarily with decision-making authority. We had an example in Arkansas where somebody who was a long-term agency employee who had great you know, knowledge, who asked questions about this algorithm uh, before it was adopted, and their, their perspective was totally sidelined because it wasn't along the political and, and policy ends. Um, that were governing at that time. So, you know, you have all these dynamics um, at play that that make it hard. Um, but, um, yeah, anyway, I guess I don't know what my butt is after that. <laughs> well, you know, that one of the things that that makes me think about is um, the ways that organizations are socialized also um, contributes to this. I'm thinking of there was a, a report on the universal credit system in the in the UK um, that looked at um, some of the things that um, 
uh, were, were, to put it mildly, less than ideal in the implementation of, of that system. And one of the, one of the uh, findings was that um, part of it was a sort of organizational culture of um, uh, not rewarding people for asking hard questions or pointing out problems, a sort of culture of um, forced positivity. And, you know, if you're thinking about, as you said, you know, an ordinary common sense would tell you that if you're implementing a system that's going to make a big change, you should be able to think about, okay, what are all the ways this could go wrong? And this is how engineers and safety critical systems are socialized to think, right? You start doing failure analysis and you start thinking about all the different ways uh, that the system could come apart. And yet in these kinds of social engineering contexts, uh, often the culture runs the other way. And the culture is uh, one of, uh, let's assume the uh, the best always. Uh, let's assume success. It's And so someone who asks the right questions and uses their knowledge in that way you described uh, is, is probably politically going to be punished for it or not empowered within the organization to lead. Does that does that sort of seem to, to match up with your experience as well? Yeah, that's exactly the dynamic. Yeah. That's well, again, I, I think it's these broader cultural changes that we're, we're, we're maybe needing to see. Um, there's, a, there's a question in the chat that's actually kind of taking a, a step, uh, narrowing in from these kind of bigger structural questions we've been grappling with. Um, and I think it's a great question, one I'm curious about as well. How easy was it for you to get access uh, to the code uh, that you mentioned? Um, and, uh, and how did you go about making sense of it? Did you, did you have to train yourself in, in, in uh, reading uh, this code? Is, are there tools that, um, that people can use to either make it easier to access uh, these algorithms uh, uh, and the code behind them or, or really parse what's going on with them? So we were very fortunate in terms of access to the algorithm. We were fortunate in that the state didn't put up a fight, um, that it was subject to our Freedom of Information Act and Freedom of Information laws. Um, and that the founder of the algorithm didn't think his algorithm could be cop copyrighted. Mm. So um, we, the access issue wasn't as big of a deal. Some of the other famous cases, I think uh, the Houston teachers case, if folks are familiar with that, where teachers were being evaluated by an algorithm and then decided whether they'd be fired or retained or whatever. Uh, uh, demerited. Um, there, I think there was a protective order where, you know, you could see the algorithm, but it was only the attorney in a room, whatever. So there's, uh, presumably, there's there's some way to get access usually, um, though not always, and certainly not when it becomes uh, the vendors themselves that are asserting the privacy interest. It gets a lot more complicated. Once we got the actual access, it was me just studying it. I mean, honestly, and this was only 21 pages of code. And since I've learned more about algorithms, it was fairly simplistic in the sense it was a bunch of if-thens. It was a lot of things that arranged in different constellations. It wasn't simple for me, but I guess as far as algorithms go, it was, uh, it was simplistic. So I was able to, to perceive it. But, and the way I did that was like, I have assessments. So I have the inputs and I have something of the outputs. And then it was figuring which of the inputs correlate to which variables named here, and then how all that works together in different sort of constellations of material factors. That took me a ton of time. I mean, it was just me studying at night, like, and trying to figure it out and piece it together. Um, in terms of tools that would help other people not do that, since, since I did that, um, we've made friends in the tech justice world, right? Mm -hmm. um, where there are many folks who are happy to help advocates try to understand whatever the technical problems are in their cases. Um, and one such organization is Upturn, which is a DC-based um, uh, organization that just does wonderful work and has worked with a lot of advocates like this. There have been many people in industry who privately offer to volunteer on this stuff. So I think if you're having something like that, if you get in touch with DFF or you get in touch with AI Now or with me or whoever, maybe we could find somebody for the technical expertise. On a mass scale, though, um, you know, there's, there's nothing there and no other way to decode some of this stuff because, um, you know, your only option then would be having the founder or somebody like that explain it and you never know how valid that is and no ability to kind of check what they're saying. So, yeah, yeah, that makes be sense. encouraged, be encouraged. You definitely can do it. And there's definitely people who want to help you out there. Um, so definitely be willing to take this on. Just know it's, you know. It's a little, little tough. 
We've got uh, just a couple more minutes for questions. So uh, uh, if you have any burning questions uh, that you uh, have uh, recently formulated and want to throw them uh, in the chat, there's still there's still a little bit of time for that. So we'd like to to encourage that. Um, there's um, uh, there's a, a follow up question here from uh, Henako who asked the earlier question about um, vendors yeah. uh, and their their liability. Um, is there a way to file a case at an earlier stage before a catastrophic error actually occurs, even before the implementation uh, of the algorithm? And, and what are the hurdles for, for doing that? Um, or are we currently boxed into a scenario where um, we really have to wait for people to get grievously hurt? So there's, it depends on your public participation laws where you're at. In the U.S., generally, no, you wouldn't be able to file a case until a decision has been made to adopt it and probably until its implementation is somewhat imminent, um, both because of the law itself and then concepts around who has standing to bring suit, who's going to be harmed, how, how, who has sufficiently imminent harm to be able to challenge something. Um, but when we think about big picture accountability reform, that's one idea is that there would be public part increased public participation points with the ability to either slow down or stop Im implementation um, before it goes, you know, before it, it affects everybody. Um, and so that's one thing that I think people definitely should be thinking about and pushing forward for um, wherever else it goes. Otherwise, no. <laughs> Otherwise, no. And that's another one of these problems, right? Is if you implement, if you if you implement a human-based, you know, policy reform of some sort, it's going to be deployed fairly slowly just out of capacity limitation. You implement an algorithmic-based policy um, change, and there's a it's it's going to be implemented on a much massive, a much more massive scale, much more quickly, um, causing much more harm. And that's something that our existing legal structures uh, just don't take into account. Let me ask uh, one one last question before I hand it back to, to Jonathan. Um, you know, there are some interesting uh, and potentially promising uh, developments on the policy and uh, political side. Uh, we're seeing the, um, the sort of revitalization and restoration of the uh, White House Office of Science and Technology Policy um, under some very good leadership. Um, there's movements in the EU uh, towards uh, AI regulation uh, that, that uh, is relevant to algorithmic decision making. Um, how many of these political developments are you uh, kind of tracking and, and how optimistic are you uh, that we're seeing uh, at least the beginnings of a shift uh, towards being willing uh, to change the political landscape and the incentives? Uh, I mean, it's encouraging that this stuff is is being thrust into the public discourse more and that, you know, people from the advocacy side have some seats at the table. I'm a little worried that it seems like the middle position or the, the position that everybody's coalescing around is, you know, account, is transparency and human in the loop kind of um, stuff. And that's really problematic because that doesn't get at the underlying um, underlying political projects and underlying devastation. Um, that's caused. And it's interesting, you know, I, I know the, the new European um, regulation that came out a few months ago, I reviewed that for one of these chats. And clearly, I don't have the full legal basis to understand its implementation. But I was pretty disappointed in what I saw. Um, you know, you had California pass uh, the US's first kind of sort of GDPR like um, thing. And their um, one of the leaders who pushed it said that they couldn't, the, the main sticking point that was beyond possibilities was a private right of action to enforce it, um, you know, meaning that regular yeah. people couldn't go to court around it. Um, so those are, you know, not hopeful indicators <laughs> of, um, of where the consensus is going. So I think, again, you know, having motivated people around this, having communities that are experiencing the harms activated, putting resources into organizing and getting all that going as soon as possible is key because, you know, once there's some sort of legislative or regulatory consensus, it's going to be hard to change that 
afterwards. Now there's this kind of rare moment of opening where all the political divisions aren't purely set. Um, and there might be some possibilities that may not exist in a few more years. That's a great point um, that actually um, half measures can be more of an obstacle to uh, an acceptable outcome uh, than uh, a situation like the present where everyone is aware that the situation is unacceptable and untenable and and and, and needs to be remediated. And so uh, it's it, you're right that this is the critical moment to make sure uh, that the, those reforms and those remedies are are substantive and and real um, and get at um, the the deeply human um, needs that uh, that really ought to be at the center of our of our concern. Thank you so much, Kevin, uh, for for talking with us today and for answering our audience's questions, um, and for uh, uh, being uh, so forthright and and honest about uh, the challenges that that you're seeing in this landscape and and the importance of. Uh, of, of being uh, sort of principled and uncompromising uh, in, in moving forward in the right direction with people. I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, Jonathan uh, to, to wrap us up. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. And thank you to you for, for moderating this conversation and for sharing your own insights into the need to, to promote the value of common care in these contexts. And Kevin, yeah, just to echo what Shannon said, thank you so much for taking the time to talk us through not just your litigation campaign, but also some of your views on new forms of accountability, the importance of participatory efforts, and uh, some of the things that still need to be done before the courts, and for sharing your views on the need for remedies in the EU's proposal for an AI Act, which I'm sure many in the audience would uh, agree with you on. Um, and for everyone else, thank you for, for joining us. Please note that this webinar has been recorded and that the recording will be made available on our website and our YouTube channel soon. So for those of you who want to revisit anything that was discussed today, um, or for those who couldn't attend, you know, it'll be available there uh, shortly. And for the academics among you, feel free to use the video in your teaching uh, and your research. Our next event in the series will take place next week on, on Wednesday, the 27th of October, when we will be joined by Wuda Ibrams Fiker and Kuda Hove. And they'll be talking about digital payments, protecting the rights against the privatization of social security in South Africa. And there's still time to register for that event by following the link on our website. Um, but for now, thank you very much for participating today. And I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as we did here at DFF. Um, and now, you know, we're going to be humane and finish on time. So um, thanks again. And it's now safe to leave uh, this webinar. Thank you. Thank you all very much for having me. And please, anybody out there, feel free to contact me if there's anything I can help with. Thank you, Kevin.